is the judge of truth. Begin with Psalm 121. Asa enai el haharim me ayin yavo ezri. Ezri me im adonai ose shamayim va'aretz. Al yiten lamot raglacha, al yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. Adonai shomrecha, adonai tzilcha al yad yiminecha. Yomam hashemesh do yekeka veyarech belayla. Adonai shmarcha mikol ra yishmor et nafshecha. Adonai shmar tzeicha uvoecha me'ata va'ad olam. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. He is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you from all harm. He will guard your soul. You're going and you're coming, now and forever. Death has taken our beloved Leonard Nyman. Friends grieve in the darkened world. In their silence there is lamentation. In their tears there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, and be with them. For Leonard's love that united so many people in life, and which death cannot sever, for his companionship that we shared along life's path, and which continues through the tenderness of memory, for the gifts of his heart and mind that brought joy and happiness, and is now a precious remembrance. For all of these and more, we give our thanks to God. Even in the fullness of Leonard's years, it is a time of grief. And so we listen once again to the voice of our sacred scriptures. It brings us the ever new message of God's nearness. It tells us of our kinship with the Creator, in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. Together in the English, let us recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have four people delivering eulogies for our dear Leonard. We begin with his daughter Susan and then nephew Mitchell. It's not as long as it looks, it's big type. First of all, thank you all for coming. I'm not a Clevelander for a, a long time and getting out in this weather is greatly appreciated, so thank you. So about a year and a half ago, I was in Florida with our dad, and we were walking his dog, Coco, to whom he was truly devoted. When he turned to me and he said, look at this, pointing to the golf course, I'm not a golfer. I would have never thought that growing up in the Depression, when we didn't even know just how poor we were, that I would be able to live in a place like this, that I would be able to golf whenever I wanted, and that I would have had four beautiful wives. I've been such a lucky man. <laughs> and I thought of a line from a Mary Oliver poem that says, sometimes I need only to stand wherever I am to be blessed, because that's how he saw his life. All of the people that he came into contact with, his children and Harriet's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, friends and business associates. We all lost Leonard this past Wednesday, 
but we had been losing him slowly all over the past several years to Alzheimer's. Sometimes he couldn't always recognize us on the phone, but he always recognized us in person. A, a little over a week ago when he was quite ill and my brother Michael flew down with his grandson Jack, when Jack walked in the room, he opened his arms and went, Jack, <laughs> you know, when I had been prepping them for not knowing, possibly knowing them. Um, he al so he always knew us in person. Sometimes he couldn't remember the specifics of our lives that stick with certainly my brother and my sister and myself. Like, sorry, Rabbi, when the rabbi wanted to suspend me from Hebrew school. And he said, Rabbi, different rabbi. Different rabbi. Different rabbi. rabbi, that's what she wants. I think she should have to come more often. <laughs> or a comment not repeatable here, when he discovered Michael was keeping a motorcycle at our cousin's house when he was in high school or of his conversations with Jane when they were driving cross country when she was moving for a new job. To all these things when we would remind him, he would smile, shrug his shoulders and say, really? Oh well. Alzheimer's did rob him of the memory of saying to my mother, maybe we should adopt more children after Jane was born. But then came Michael and he got a son to carry on the Nyman name. I think he would have had more children, but my mother was done. Sometimes he couldn't remember the 44 years he spent with her, like the time when I was out to dinner with him and my mother shortly before she passed. And he looked around the room and he said, Norma, you're still the most beautiful woman in the room. To which she responded, can we order now? Maybe it was best he could not remember that. But what Alzheimer's did not rob him of was of his love of singing to Frank and Ella. It did not rob him of, rob him of his love of dancing with every sister, daughter, niece, friends, and Harriet. At Zoe's bat mitzvah a few years ago, he had been discharged from the hospital at 5 p.m., and at 7 he was on the dance floor. And at 10 I had to turn to my brother Michael and say, tell him he needs to go home, but he still had another dance in him. He and Harriet were dancing just a little over a month ago in Florida. Alzheimer's did not rob him of his ability to express his emotions, to tell family and friends repeatedly that he loved them, that he cared about them. On a personal note, he regularly, rem <laughs> he regularly reminded me that I was a great part of the reason that he married my mother when I was four. Alzheimer's did not rob him of his ability to be kind and caring, to relish the times he spent with nieces and nephews, young and old, his and Harriet's, to get down on the floor to read with them, to play with them, to always keep up with what was happening in everyone's life, to go to every bar and bat mitzvah or wedding, thank you Jennifer and Mitchell, or any family picnic. A cousin of mine now living in Vancouver said to me this week, you know, whenever he would visit you, I live near Seattle, he always came up to see us. My kids said he should have been a teacher. He loved children so much. And my children adored him and always looked forward to his visits. Alzheimer's did not rob him of his memory of his time in the Army Airborne during World War II as a paratrooper. I could never imagine him jumping out of a plane. He wore his 11th Airborne hat proudly until he died. He laughed and shrugged his shoulders when we told him, you know, the only pictures we have of you in Japan was of you with your arms around young Japanese women, which probably started a pattern for him. <laughs> when we showed him pictures of himself in uniform last week, he smiled and whispered, I was so good looking, I should have just stayed in LA and been a model or an actor. We were glad he didn't. Alzheimer's did not rob him of the fondness he had for his sisters, always feeling responsible for and devoted to all four of them because their father died when they were young. He always made sure Claire had a ride to every family gathering. He loved the summer excursions to see sister Sissy and her family on the farm in Pennsylvania where we got to drink thick cream off the top of a bottle of fresh milk. He later moved to Delray Beach where his sister Judy lived and saw her weekly bringing her lox and bagel sandwiches and a chocolate pastries. And finally, whenever he was in Cleveland, he would always visit his youngest sister Cookie, bringing coconut bars to her because she did not want Russian tea biscuits. 
the Nymans had a love for pastry. After my mother died, he declared to us, I'm never getting married again. Then he called me three weeks later to say, you know, I sat home for three nights and it just didn't work for me. So Duty has been fixing me up and well, I've met someone, can you come down to meet her? After that brief marriage ended, he said once again, never getting married again. And a year later he called to tell me, did I tell you Harriet and I got married yesterday? To which I responded, you said you were never getting married again. And he chuckled and replied, well, I just like women. I like good looking women and I like being married and Harriet is great. So we're married and we're off to Europe tomorrow. I'll call you when I get back. He loved travel because he loved history. He was thrilled to be visiting historical sites in Israel or exploring museums in New York. And he was as thrilled to do that as he was walking through old growth forests with me in the Pacific Northwest. A former lumberman, he knew his dug fur from his cedar. And so at 70, at 80, ooh, so at 80, he set off on a great adventure with Harriet and found a great love for the last part of his life. With Harriet came her large family of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and their celebrations, and they, like his Cleveland family, discovered his kindness and his unequivocal presence that he gave to each person he met and his corny jokes. Alzheimer's may have robbed him of his ability to write letters to the editor, but it did not rob him of his interest in politics. An ardent supporter of democratic causes, he once called Rush Limbaugh's show and told him, Rush, we're only as good as the least among us. And as the son of immigrants, he believed that public schools and the public libraries were the things that made America great. He always read the paper and the news ticker on MSNBC. Even when he could only partially understand what he was reading, he would read it aloud to us. He got enormous satisfaction from driving the golf ball long and straight and frustrated at a short putt missed. He was golfing until he was 92. He was still walking a 15-minute mile at the fitness center five days a week on the treadmill as recently as six months ago and told me I couldn't keep up with him because his legs were longer. Alzheimer's did not rob him of his love for sweets, Russian tea biscuits after breakfast, milkshakes after lunch, coconut bars after dinner, nor his enjoyment of a good Rob Roy perfect. Harriet's friends in Florida who supported us these last two weeks alternated between describing him as kind, as wonderful, as sweet and loving, and my favorite, delicious. He responded by calling them in his whispered left of what he had left of a voice, hey beautiful, darling, good looking, he excelled at flattery. A man of substance and intelligence, he had a lightness of being. Alzheimer's never robbed him of always having a kind word, he thanked every nurse and hospice worker these last few weeks. He never complained. He smiled and told them all he was good, and he was. He lived, he lived a lot longer than we expected, and I think it was because he loved life so much he just didn't want to leave. So when you think of him, have a Rob Roy, sing to your favorite song in the car, eat some pastry, and always, always dance. After Mitch, after Mitchell, Robbie's coming forward, and then Terry's coming forward. So please do. My uh, cousins, Michael and Janie and Susie, have asked me to say a few words, and Harriet has asked me to say a few words, and uh, yeah, I am privileged and honored to do so. Uh, my uncle Leonard Nyman. He was a great many things to a great many people. And his Alzheimer's did not rob any of us of our many memories of my uncle. He was, he was a, a family man. He was a patriarch. He was a leader of a family. And he led by example. He didn't lecture. He led by the words he used and the acts and the deeds that he did. 
and he always did the right thing. He never did the wrong thing. I have so many memories from Byron Road when I was a child, and Michael and Judy and Jeffrey and the JCs from Detroit, Jimmy, Jennifer, and Joanne, we were all kids. And those satyrs, it was like, it was like organized chaos, a cacophony of everything from our beloved Grandma Molly, the Kaplans from Detroit, Joan and Sidney Halper, Halper and <laughs> Uncle Sidney always instigating Michael to do something that would always inevitably get him scolded if not cracked across the top of his head by my Uncle Leonard. And Jeffrey and myself and Michael, we, we always ended up in Michael's bedroom hatching some very ill-conceived harebrained plan to go downstairs and irritate all the adults, which was not hard to do. We did it and we loved it and I'll never forget those gatherings and, and, and it was beautiful, it was great. Just an innocent time long ago. The loss of my uncle is the passing of an era. It's not just the death of a loved, beloved uncle and great uncle and grandfather. It, this is the passing of a time that doesn't exist anymore. Never a foul word came from that man's mouth. He didn't need to use that kind of language to get his points through. I did see him lose his temper a few times, and again, <laughs> usually directed towards my cousin Michael. <laughs> but so he was a leader. He was a leader of our family. He was the leader of the Nyman family. He was a patriarch, and he set a wonderful example of how to live my life through good, hard, honest work and family first. That's what. That's what Leonard Nyman was all about. He was a man's man. He was a family man. He was a man's man. He came up through the construction trades in Cleveland, Ohio, at a pivotal time for organized labor. And let me tell you something. If you weren't in that, if you weren't in that segment, the labor movement in Cleveland was one of the epicenters of the labor movements in Cleveland. And my Uncle Leonard dealt with those union organizers and those business agents no differently than he dealt with his laborers and carpenters, and no differently than he dealt with the wealthiest landowners in Cleveland that he was going to build something for, because he was a genuine guy. He was a real man. He would make his points known just by being himself. He didn't have to use foul language. He didn't have to lose his temper to make his points known. He was always genuine. He was always real. There was nothing phony about this man. He was a big brother. He lost his father at 17, and that affected him deeply and greatly, and he gave back when he got his life together. And he had his family, he gave back to the big brothers, and he mentored many a young man through the difficulties of life without a father. And it was a very inspiring thing to see for me as a 17, 18 year old when I started to realize what a great man this was. And uh, I think my cousin Susie kind of touched on it a little bit. He was a little bit of a ladies' man. Because he was Hollywood handsome, and not just because he's my uncle, everybody join us for Shiva and look at the pictures. He really was a strikingly handsome, strikingly handsome, powerful man who could get what he wanted and needed through a very gentle approach. My uncle was always surrounded with beautiful, by beautiful women from, from the minute he was born, from our beautiful and beloved memory, Grandma Molly Nyman, to all of his sisters, my beloved aunts, our beloved aunts, from our Aunt Claire to our Aunt Sissy to our Aunt Duty Kaplan, 
always the belle of the ball. My Aunt Dottie was quite a lady, and uh, he loved her and all of his sisters so much. To uh, my mother, our mother, Cookie, who can't be here with us today because of her afflictions. But a mother, my grandmother Molly, could never have asked for a better son than my uncle. And my aunts, his sisters, could never wish for a better brother than Leonard Nyman. I spoke with my cousin Jennifer over this last week, and uh, she really captured it better than I can, the closeness and the support uh, of these five kids. Well, they were started as children. They were grown adults when I came along. It was special. It was really something that you don't see very often. And my uncle Leonard loved his sisters, and he supported them in anything and everything they did. And they loved him back in ways that are just very special and unique that, you know, we all should really embrace and try to live our lives in that way like Leonard Yelts Leonard Nyman lived his, his, his <laughs> more than, like Leonard Nyman lived his life. It was a good life, and it was a great life, actually. And then came along the beautiful and exciting and vivacious and energetic Hillary, Harriet, <laughs> for, for, Forgive me, I have been a bit dyslexic. Harriet. Harriet, Harriet, you gave my uncle the last 13 years of his life. And in many respects, those were some of the best years of his life. And I talked to Harriet earlier this week to express my condolences, and I said, you know, Harriet, I said, I don't know how my uncle kept up with you. I mean... They're flying into Cleveland for the summers, and they got their home base. They're off to Columbus. They're off to Chicago. They're off to Italy. They're off to his. They were. I'm like, how did, how did he keep up with you? And she goes, Mitchell, I don't know how I kept up with him. And it's true. They had 13 great years together. And uh, let's see what else did I think about my uncle. I've got some lasting memories. I've got so many lasting memories of my uncle, but, but Susan said it, you know, uh, at my daughter, our daughter Zoe's bat mitzvah. We finished dinner, and the minute they struck up the band, Leonard and Harriet were out on that dance floor. I mean, it was like they were 25 years old. And they were tearing it up, and they're jitterbugging, and they're ballroom dancing, and the moves. But more so than that, the happiness and the joy and the nachis and the pleasure that he had to be there with his beloved Harriet. And I'm like, man, look at these two go. Uh, Finette's lasting memory, one of many, is at Josh Flink's bar mitzvah, and our beautiful darling Zoe was only five years old, so he went from ballroom dancing at 91. You know, Zoe's bar mitzvah was only three years ago. He went from ballroom dancing at 91. You, you know, you go back a few years before that, and he's boogieing down with his little five-year-old great niece, and it's a beautiful memory that I'll never forget. <coughs> the crowning jewel of my Uncle Leonard's legacy is he went to his grave knowing that there's a young man here that's named Jack Nyman, and that is the crowning jewel of my uncle's legacy he was so proud to know that there's a young man here that carries the name of his father that god willing will give us another generation of nymans michael susie janie you had the best dad anybody could ever 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 ask for and jack you had the best grand grandfather a young man could ever dream of. Michael, you've done a great job in filling those big shoes. And Jack, we're all so proud to have you in our lives. And so, I'm a bit dyslexic. I 
here, here he is. She's, she's my aunt. My uncle Leonard, he was a great uncle. He was a great uncle to Jacob and Zoe and Skye and the Flinks, Molly and Shana and Josh and Lily. He was a great uncle. He was a grandfather. He was an uncle and a father and a friend and a leader. But he was a great uncle in like mighty and important and meaningful and real and a, 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 a better man I could never ever have known and been blessed to have in my life so cousins thank you for having me up here we'll have you come forward and then and then Terry and so far to all of those words spoken as a prayer, let us say amen. I, uh, I don't really have anything written, so this is kind of ad-libbed. Hope you guys don't mind. Man, the time I think of Leonard and Harriet, I think of one time when I was in high school, Scott, my little brother, was in middle school, and we, uh, we got into the ice cream. And we only had a little bit off the top, but Harry and Leonard heard of that, and immediately they were like, oh, you guys got to ask for the ice cream first, and then they go off on us. And finally, Scott and I just have enough. We're like, all right, we hop in the car, we go buy them all new ice cream, we get back, and now we're just mad at them. We're like, you know what, whatever, we're never eating your ice cream ever again. And at first, you know, I was, like, upset. I was like, well, why do you care about ice cream so much, you know? It's just a little bit. We didn't eat all of it. But it was the principle of it. They are teaching me and Scott to be responsible, to be adults. And that's what, that's what Leonard, that's what Harriet, that's what Michael, that's what Jane, that's what Sue, that's what all of them have done our entire lives. You know, when I first, when I first met the Nymans, you know, I wasn't – Family wasn't in the greatest place, you know, we were kind of poor, um, and uh, one day, you know, we just move into this big house with a big yard, here my mom has a new boyfriend, and I'm going to have a new brother, I'm like, what, what's going on, I don't know this guy, you know, <laughs> I meet Mike, he's a big dude, I'm still little at the time, I'm scared of him, you know, but, <laughs> but he, he welcomes me into his house with open arms, and first Christmas, you know, I haven't even met my grandparents on his side yet, you know, we get, we get presents from them, you know, from Graham and Gramps, and obviously they don't know what I like, they give me some, some stupid little dinosaur book, you know, but I still have the book, it's, <laughs> just proves that without even meeting me, you know, they welcomed me into their family, they accepted me as, as their own grandson, you know, they wrote Graham and Gramps, not Harriet and Leonard, you know. And I don't know where I'd be without them. You know, Leonard was a good man to look up to, a good man to, to, to follow in his footsteps. And he had a great son, Michael, who every day has taught me to be a man, be responsible. You know, made me start working for him when I was 14. It'd be eight years now almost, not seven, six, seven years now. And... When I joined the military, I remember uh, I did a project on Leonard when I was in probably end of middle school. On uh, It was like Generations Day, they called it, and I asked him to tell me a story about when he was in the service. He told me he was doing his uh, job training for artillery, and you know he has this one specific uh, dream he'd always have where he would wind back the, uh, the artillery round and he would shoot it at a tank. You just hear ting, and he like ask sergeant. He'd be like, sergeant, what's going on? Like you hit it, but you didn't hit it straight on. He'd uh, wake up, you know, every morning with that same dream. He's like, man, I gotta get out of here. So he wrote his uh, wrote his congressman. They told him about this new experimental uh, experimental branch they're doing. They're calling him Airborne. Uh, I believe it's 82nd, 11th, 11th Airborne. My bad, my bad. 11th Airborne, and so he goes, does the airborne training, and then he, you know, 
sent off to uh, to uh, to Japan, and <laughs> and we all know what he was doing over in Japan. But <laughs> and once uh, by the time I was in, you know that that thought of him, you know, being able to make it through and going to Japan, it um. It was one of the things that kept me going in basic, you know, it made me not quit, it made me want to work as hard because, man, airborne, that's so cool. You get to jump out of planes, you know, parachute in, like, that's, that's, that's some movie stuff. And, um, and when I got back, I would have drill, I'm in the National Guard, so I'd have drill on the weekends, and him and Harry were over the entire summer, like they do almost every summer. And this was right around the time his mind started to go, but I remember every time I'd see him, and I'm in my uniform, he just gave me this big grin, just like he's so proud of me, you know? And it was every single time I'd see that grin, how happy he was for me, and I'd always ask him about stories, and we'd have to guide him through them, but it was just, it was great. It was great seeing him proud of me, you know, seeing the man who tried, who had been raising me to be a man was finally proud of me. He's always been proud of me, but now I, really feel like I was worth all of his efforts. For that, I thank Leonard, I thank Harriet, I thank Michael, I thank Sue, Jane, Mitchell, Yelsky, Imans, everyone, for making me the man I am today. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <coughs> Nobody's ever told me to speak up. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Leonard was a blessing to our whole family. I think Susan expressed it well when she said he had a lightness of being. He was so sweet and loving, and it was always a pleasure to be with him. He loved our mother and brought joy to her these past 13 years. He shared his love with all of us. He shared stories and his wisdom generously, and we loved being with him. We wanted to thank the Nyman family and God for bringing him into our lives. He will be missed. And now to all of those words spoken as a prayer, let us say amen. It seems that each time I am privileged and honored to do a funeral in this family, uh, the whole eulogy that I've prepared, I don't have to deliver. So just let me say one thing and then I'll just say amen. Leonard is a, a reminder of a, a portion in the Torah we're coming up to soon. We're in the book of Exodus now. And in another several weeks, we're going to be reading Exodus chapter 35 and 36. And it's when our ancestors were um, told to bring the materials to do the construction on the tabernacle. So construction, Leonard, the family. And our ancestors are commanded to bring materials for the construction. Why do they need to build a tabernacle? As they're schlepping through the wilderness, it is a portable temple. They camp, they set it up. They break camp, they take it down. So you have to have good materials. It has to be constructed well. It needs to be beautiful, and it needs to be functional. So our ancestors are commanded to bring materials for the construction, and they are bringing, and they bring, and they bring, and they bring, the Torah says in Exodus 35. And finally, in Exodus 36, verse 6, there was just one problem. Our ancestors didn't know when to stop bringing the materials. Let no man or woman make further efforts toward gifts for the sanctuary. Now, this doesn't usually happen in building funds. You know, you do a building campaign, people, they don't want to give. It's not that they want to give too much. The point of Leonard is that just like our ancestors didn't know when to stop bringing, same with Leonard. He didn't know when to stop. He didn't know when to stop being loving. He didn't know when to stop being generous. He didn't know when to stop paying for lunches. Whenever you went out to lunch, he would pay, right? 
He didn't know when to stop being a loving husband and grandfather, brother, all of those things. And thank God, he didn't know when to stop. So his loving memory will be with us. Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yehishem Adonai Mavarach, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And together let us say, Amen. Please rise for the El Malei Rachamim prayer, and then we will go in procession to the cemetery. It's cold outside, so the reason we did the military honors here is it's cold outside, really cold outside. And when we get to the cemetery, we will lower the casket. We will, we will lay his body to rest briefly. It will be brief. And then we'll gather back at, the, uh, at Abby and Michael's house, and it will be warm and loving, and there will be beverages, and there will be food, and we will continue to talk about Leonard. But it will be warm and dry. And they'll be there tonight until 8 o'clock, and tomorrow from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And we'll do Kaddish for Leonard every Friday for the next month at Temple Israel near Tamid. And the kids in religious school will do Kaddish for him, and the kids in Hebrew school will do Kaddish for him, because the kids need reps on the Kaddish. And um, the man certainly worth saying Kaddish for. Into your care, O God, we entrust the spirit of Leonard Nyman, for you keep faith with your children in death as in life. Sustain us, we may meet with serenity the mysteries that lie ahead, knowing that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, O God, are with us, a loving friend in whom we put our trust. You are the light of our life, our hope in eternity. El male rachamim, shochen bamromim, hametze menucha nechona, tachat kanfe hashkina, im kedoshim utahorim, kezoha harakia masirim, et nishmat. Lebo ben Yaakov ben Dit, Shalak Lola Mo, Baal Harachamim, Yasti Rehu Besete Knafav, Le Olamim, Bayit Roho Besor Hachaim, Et Nishmato, Adonai Hunacharato. Bianuach be shalom al mishkavo benomar amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Lebo ben Yaakov ben Dit to our dear Leonard Nyman. He has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. The gentleman will come forward now and give us instructions for the processional to the cemetery. If you're not going to the cemetery and you just want to come back to the house, about an hour and 15 minutes from now, we will be at the house.